Your Excellency Dr. Khalid bin Mohammed Latia. Your Excellency Mr. Jassim bin Saif Sulaiti. Your Excellencies, honored ambassadors, distinguished guests, and, and colleagues, students. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of Georgetown University in Qatar, I am delighted to welcome you to, to tonight's event, a conversation with His Excellency Dr. Khalid bin Mohammed Al Atiyah, Qatar, and the lessons of the 1000 day blockade. His Excellency has been a critical player in Qatar's defense strategy since the beginning of the blockade. And his breadth of experience covering international politics, finance, communications, law and defense uniquely position him to talk about the various aspects of state security for the state of Qatar during the past 1,000 days of the blockade and the preparations that have been made to safeguard the nation's future. His Excellency has been a great friend of Qatar Foundation and Georgetown University, not least through his role in personally recruiting UF graduates, nurturing their energy and investing in their future. We are delighted and honored that His Excellency has generously agreed to share his knowledge with the QF community to mark the 100th day of the blockade. There is truly very much that can be highlighted about His Excellency's career. His Excellency began his career as a fighter pilot in the Qatari Emiri Air Force after receiving his BA in aviation studies from King Faisal Air Academy. He went on to study law, earning a BA in law from Beirut Arab University, an MA in public law from Cairo University, and a PhD in law from Cairo University. His Excellency then established the Khalid bin Muhammad Latiyah firm for legal consultation and services. And while practicing as a lawyer, was appointed president of the National Committee for Human Rights. He then went on to hold the ministerial positions of Minister of State for International Cooperation and Acting Minister of Business and Commerce. His Excellency's other roles include Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of Qatar Stock Exchange, Vice Chairman of Qatar Financial Center Authority, and Vice Chairman of the Supreme Council for Information Technology and Communications. In 2011, His Excellency was appointed Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and a member of the Council of Ministers and held the role of Minister of Foreign Affairs until his appointment in 2016 in his current role as Minister, as Minister of State for Defense Affairs. And importantly for us as, as an educational institution, His Excellency is a firm believer and investor in the youth of Qatar, having surrounded himself with youthful energy since his early days in the National Committee for Human Rights. We at Georgetown University have been fortunate to welcome him on several occasions during his tenure as foreign minister when he engaged with our students and encouraged them to join the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then took, him with them, took, took them with him to the Ministry of uh, Defense. I know I speak for all of us, Your Excellency, in expressing gratitude for your deter determined efforts to support tomorrow's leaders in Qatar. <coughs> The theme of today's dialogue comes out of a course taught by Dr. Rory Miller and Dr. Fahd al Mari on the challenges and opportunities for small states in the increasingly globalized world. This is part of a larger effort to build up Georgetown Qatar's range of courses on security studies alongside its wider offerings on international relations, regional studies, and diplomacy, in line, of course, with the strong tradition of our campus in Washington, D.C. in this field. Today, we offer courses on Gulf security, intelligence, and national security, as well as small state security to our students. Dr. Miller and, and Dr. Elmari also have research projects underway on energy security and security alliances, and have launched a cybersecurity research group in order to think about threats and opportunities in the rapidly evolving security environment we inhabit. After the public event tonight, his Excellency has agreed to hold a private session with students taking international and regional security courses so that they have a chance to ask additional questions and further benefit from His Excellency's knowledge. Your Excellency. Sorry for the long introduction, but it's really small. It's short. It's, it's as short as I, can, I can, can do. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really honored. 
If I may, I would like to begin our conversation with a broad overview of the topic drawing on your experience with Qatar's overall strategy for security and alliance. In the early days of the blockade, Qatar was unexpectedly faced with a formidable challenge, with rumors or maybe realities of hostile forces amassing on the nation's borders. You were part of the core team working under the leadership of His Highness the Emir to mobilize Qatar's response to this challenge. Could you please share with us, in broad terms, what effect the imposition of the blockade had on the leaders of Qatar? What were some of the key challenges you faced? And what initial solutions you deployed in the face of this threat? Dear Ahmed, first of all, thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here with you. And I would like to thank your distinguished guests for being here with us. And honestly speaking, uh, uh, Georgetown and uh, your uh, neighbor campus are a symbol of pride for everyone who lives in, in, in Doha. And I'm not saying this because you are uh, having me here today. I'm saying this from our experience and my personal experience with the, with the outcome of this esteemed uh, institution. So uh, thank you for all your effort with us. And uh, I hope uh, we can... Uh, get more of you years uh, to come. And today it will not be a meeting with our student. It will be a, a head hunting session, inshallah, after <laughs> I should be prepared. Uh, back to your question, Dean Ahmed. I would uh, start with this. I rather uh, call it, uh, uh, honestly speaking, I'd, I'd rather call it a 1,000 day of victory, rather a 1,000 day of blockade. And I will tell you how did we uh, manage to weather the storm. Uh, the story behind uh, attacking Qatar and trying to uh, course us uh, to submission uh, started with the nerve, uh, you know, war of nerves, if you may call. And because of the uh, wisemanship of His Highness the Emir, we have implemented the, tri, the golden triangle, which I'm sure while we, uh, uh, while we discuss this uh, subject, uh, we will touch on each one of them. It's the, his, his Highness, the Emir Wisemanship, and you know, his government, the people of, of Qatar, and our friends. And I, when I say friend, is friends, ally, and uh, you know, uh, countries who uh, did not believe on what the... Uh, Quartet uh, come with, and they uh, stood with, with Qatar. So this golden triangle versus the evil triangle, who tried to, to plant the uh, chaos confusion uh, in, in the state of Qatar. They wanted to break us from within, and uh, you know, with the uh, with the help of God, with the help of our people, uh, with the help of the expat also, who had played an excellent role during the first uh, period of the blockade or embargo, uh, we managed, as I said, to, to uh, you know, uh, weather this uh, storm. Thank you, Your Excellency. You've touched briefly on, on this already, but I wonder if you could expand a bit, a little bit more. The topic of conversation tonight focuses on the idea of small state security the specific challenges and opportunities available to countries with limited population and land mass. So can you tell us, please, what it means to be a small state in today's global world and how that affects international relations and security? And in particular, what do you think the role of soft power is for a small state today? I will, uh, I'll tell you in a simple term what it means to be a small state uh, Imagine a small state, uh, you know, surrounded by big neighbors. Even if they wake up in the morning and with good faith they stretch, the pre-precaution will, will come to you and you will get the ricochet. So they will hit you. <laughs> so you have always to be, you know, uh, flexible to move around. But uh, we can look at small state from two perspectives. There is a typical way of uh, identifying a small state. Yes, I understand. 
quantitative uh, geographical size, people size, mighty, what uh, might uh, or military power you have. But in, 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 in modern uh, politics, uh, I believe this is not uh, applicable anymore if you know how to uh, use the and change the environment. Uh, today, uh, soft power plays a big role in, in, uh, in uh, categorizing the, uh, the, the countries. Uh, your deterrent uh, power, or military uh, power, and so many other things, your social, economic system. So it is not the typical uh, understanding of uh, small states uh, anymore is the uh, player now. Um, in, 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 in Europe, countries with 10 million, some people, sometimes they consider as, as a small state, and on the other hand, they, they be considered as a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a power. I won't say superpower, but as a, as a effective power. Our faculty teach and research alliances and how they can adopt to meet new threats in changing strategic environments. So how has Qatar's thinking on the role of alliances? I know this has been extremely important and extremely strategic in the case of Qatar. How has Qatar's thinking on the role of alliances evolved in the context of the blockade, specifically by bilateral alliances and their interrelationship with security needs? This is a good question, uh, Dean Ahmed. And, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a. In, I will, I will be speaking. Uh, I will be speaking from our perspective, Qatari perspective. Alliance is a byproduct of our, uh, our vision. Uh, we have a, a twenty thirty vision, and uh, through this uh, uh, vision, alliance come with our be belief on. Uh, multilateralism and bi bilateralism uh, approach. And we have started this earlier, as early as 1995. Uh, no country can stand uh, the uh, magnitude of the aggression we have faced. This is unprecedented ever. I don't know, you, you, Georgetown can, can guide me or can enlighten me if I am wrong, but this is unprecedented case uh, in history where we have this magnitude of, of uh, aggression against us uh, in 2017. But because of this uh, alliances, because of the third element in my golden triangle, which is friend, uh, uh, we manage uh, to find, uh, you know, our way. Uh, with, less than, with less than 72 hours, we had uh, friends sending us goods from all ports of the world. Uh, our port was ready to receive, uh, uh, we used to receive from one or two points on the GCC uh, to receive from all over the world. Asia, uh, you know, Far East, uh, North America, you name it. And this is only because this alliance approach and the vision of His Highness to have uh, reach out earlier and build this relation. Somewhat connected. Although the GCC was not a classic security alliance, do you agree with the idea that its absence as a functioning entity has created a vacuum in the region? And linked to this, his Highness the Emir has spoken on the need to build new frameworks and mechanisms that foster peace and security across the wider region. Could you please expand on that vision and how you think these efforts will develop in the future? Yeah. Historically speaking, uh, I think the uh, GCC uh, born because a certain uh, station through the uh, history. Uh, for example, in 79, uh, on our neighboring country and uh, the first Iraqi war. And this find the necessity to create the, the GCC. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main purpose of the GCC is not that's the security of, of, of the region. But uh, while we go uh, down the line and 
uh, we are facing, uh, uh, you know, this vacuum. Because uh, lacking of uh, incitement, lacking of vision, uh, trying to separate your uh, uh, policy from your people, uh, trying to hide your people in the shadow, uh, not enlightening them, enlightening them, sorry. It will, uh, you know, in the end of the road, uh, lead us uh, to, to vacuum. Any uh, entity which born uh, uh, due to necessity and not through a, a united vision or an, a, a vision where the uh, leader share together. For example, uh, NATO, uh, African Union, no offense, uh, gentlemen, but for some time, uh, European Union was because they have, uh, uh, you have a, a united, you know, you have, they have a vision, and they share a common uh, principle. If we start to lack this, then the same reason why the GCC uh, had born will be the same reason to demolish and destroy the GCC uh, itself. So do you have ideas about alternatives? Well, alternative, His Highness, the Emir uh, in the United Nations have, uh, uh, I'm not calling here, don't quote me to calling for alternative. I would like to see a united uh, GCC. I would like to see uh, Wiseman leadership uh, prevail in the GCC. But again, I refer to His Highness' speech in the United Nations uh, when he called for a, 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 a dialogue. Uh, the region uh, should come uh, together uh, and not exclude anyone to try to get out with a framework, a security uh, initially framework uh, can be followed by social, economic, and all the other things. And to sit on a round table and try to uh, come out with a, with a product where bring prosperity and stability to this region. So I think we should think now uh, broader uh, to bring the security to the region. Excuse me. Thank you, Your Excellency. The initial actions against Qatar were initiated with a cyber attack. This serves as a clear reminder of the importance of hybrid warfare, which you touched on already, <clears throat> where many different instruments of power are deployed in today's security environment. Do you think small states can have advantages in a hybrid environment over a traditional one? And if so, in what ways? Yeah. I agree with you, uh, Doctor, that we have we faced, and I'm saying this out of experience, which I lived. Uh, hyper warfare, uh, I witnessed it in all uh, aspects. We've been, uh, we've been attacked by all means. You know, uh, they attacked our social fabric. Uh, they, uh, they attacked us by cyber, uh, hijacking our, or uh, you know, uh, uh, hacking our uh, national agency. They mobilized their uh, their hardware. They did everything, uh, literally mean uh, in hyper warfare. Uh, now, uh, can small uh, states be able to be a player on hyper? I, I say yes uh, in so many elements, and uh, uh, I believe uh, in enhancing your soft power. Uh, deterrent capability uh, and uh, you know uh, social well uh, social and economic uh, plan enlightening your people I think you can be ready to face any threat of any kind if you do this and, uh, soft power does not mean uh, uh, you know having uh, media you know, media outlets. No, it's mean 360 degrees soft power. Educating your people, having uh, the best uh, education, offer them best, uh, involve them in your, uh, involve them in your uh, political decision. Uh, uh, this is the, the this is the uh, the way that I believe you can uh, counter 
uh, any threat because your country is immune from within. Uh, your people is the nation and the nation is your people. And this is the approach which we uh, always try, uh, you know, uh, try to enhance. Thank you, Your Excellency. Speaking of the particular instrument of intelligence, how do small states maximize their intelligence capabilities? And how do they do so cooperatively given the globalized world we live in and the nature of evolving threats in today's security environment? Intelligent, uh, intelligent are very important subject. And I believe most of the uh, sound uh, entities uh, such as uh, your uh, you know, esteemed entity are trying to introduce the intelligent study. And it is, it is very important, it is very crucial. Uh, again, we go back to uh, multilateralism relation and bilateralism relation. This also uh, is a key element in uh, enhancing your security uh, through, uh, through intelligence. And, uh, I believe with, uh, with uh, the new technology now, is uh, easier for a small state to be protected and uh, shield uh, itself by, uh, by enlightening and educating their people to be able to handle and produce such technology, not only to consume uh, such technology. Thank you, Your Excellency. I know you want to hear from our students, but if I may, uh, I would like to end with two general questions. You've been, soft, you've been soft to me. Let's wait and see them. <laughs> uh, they're hard on me. I don't know how they... <laughs> uh, the two general questions about the past and the road ahead. First, about the past. How did we get to this place? How has the strategic environment in the Arab Gulf over the last four decades influenced security and defense strategies and policies? And what were some of the key events and responses affecting Qatar prior to the blockade? Because we know that the, block the blockade is a culmination. It's not, it didn't happen in a vacuum and it has a past. So how did we get there? Well, as I said earlier, uh, that if the alliance being uh, find or produce uh, due to necessity, eventually this is what will happen. If the alliance is created uh, on a ground, uh, it's, uh, on a solid ground and a shared principle, it will last uh, longer. Uh, example, what we faced in Qatar was the change uh, of the game and the change of the principle from other players. Uh, greed, uh, uh, bullying, uh, uh, you know, this uh, was uh, the, I believe this was the first step in uh, destructing the system which has been for 40 years or, or so, uh, stabilizing this region. And our region was the most stable and safe region in the world. And, you know, uh, Unless there is a, a serious revision, uh, unless uh, there is a, a wise leadership praise and uh, try to stop this uh, bullying thing and uh, greed in other country, uh, I think uh, the GCC will not be the GCC we all know today. And finally, for my part, before we open it to the audience, looking forward, in what ways has the blockade of Qatar impacted the security environment of the region as a whole? And it did. And what are some of the security and defense lessons for the future? The embargo or blockade of Qatar did not affect only the region, honestly speaking. It's, uh, it has uh, affected the world. Qatar is, uh, as everybody know here, is a uh, natural gas, uh, second natural gas uh, exporter in the world. We, uh, we supply 30% of the world need. And 
and uh, again this takes us back to the first element of the uh, of the triangle that we have proven to our friend and ally that even with the worst situation the country is facing we still stick and uh, fulfill our obligation with our friend we kept the flow smoothly we did not even uh, cut the flow on our enemy who tried to destroy our country because his highness vision was to, to look into the uh, humanitarian perspective of the, of the situation there is people who are in hospital there is people who are in, in school and they use your energy uh, to uh, enlighten uh, their life so if you cut this you will affect the people and not their you know uh, Bullier's uh, leader. So Qatar has proven that it is committed and uh, this is why it makes us uh, resilient and it makes us uh, find our way uh, uh, through uh, all the crises they try to bring to us. But the funny thing, Dean uh, Ahmed, to say is as we speak today about the 1,000 day of blockade and embargo, we are counting down a thousand days for 2022 World Cup. So in Qatar, honestly speaking, we don't have time to look behind our shoulder. We are looking uh, you know, ahead and uh, uh, I recall here, uh, I recall here a, a, a quote from the Saudi minister of, uh, ex-minister of uh, foreign affairs, that he says then they would like to use with Qatar the Cuban approach. So they want to keep the blockade for what, Cuban 50 years? So I say that we passed, three years is passed. We have 47 years to work together to bring prosperity to our people. So we have time to, <laughs> to enhance our... <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, now, his Excellency has agreed to take some questions. Uh, could you please identify yourself and make sure that you have a concise question so that we have we give as many uh, as many of you as possible the opportunity to uh, to ask questions from His Excellency. Let's start with the students. What? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Al Thani. Uh, the U.S. has traditionally acted as a mediator uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, between the Arab nations. Uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, but during uh, but during the uh, in, in, during the Trump administration, obviously this blockade happened. To what extent do you think the Trump administration is res is uh, is responsible for the blockade? And uh, if they did play any role, whether it be small or significant, during the blockade. Do you think that subsequent image administrations uh, would mean a return to normalcy? Good question. Want me to answer Stop that, please? Well, uh, Abdurrahman? <laughs> Abdurrahman, is it? Yeah, okay. okay. The, uh, uh, the mistake that the blockader uh, did uh, when they decided after inviting the United States to uh, this big uh, Islamic American conference dialogue. The big mistake they did is that they thought, uh, they forget that the United States is an institutional country. And they thought that with, you know, uh, uh, having, you know, having the space uh, to uh, discuss with the White House or with the administration, that's mean they will align behind them. I think they assumed wrong. United States is an institution country. It's a friend and a strategic ally to Qatar. Uh, so with our uh, excellent relation with our ally, we have an excellent defense to defense relation. We have uh, excellent relation with the uh, uh, State Department, with the Congress and with the White House. So this was one of the, uh, the, uh, the element which uh, made uh, their plan to make Qatar, uh, you know, submission to their uh, to their uh, requ requirement or their thirteen so-called demand uh, failed. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Sabiha from Qatar Latinia. 
How do you think Qatar international foreign aid and uh, development policy have contributed to Qatar's security after the blockade? And did it play as an important soft power? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Indeed, the uh, Qatar humanitarian aid is a very powerful uh, soft power tool, to say. Uh, you reach out uh, almost everywhere. And you don't distinguish between whether it is the West, uh, Katrina, or the Far East, uh, uh, the East Coast of Japan. And uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, it played a big role. And when we talk about soft power, it's a variety of combination, uh, among which is our uh, humanitarian uh, aid tool. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is uh, Hitmi Bin Khalifa. Thank you for your uh, uh, clarifying many points, doctor. And uh, my question is related to the economical model of uh, Qatar. Have our economical model changed after the blockade? And if yes, uh, was it, is it more effective now than the previous economical model? Well, the, uh Sometime uh, during uh, unforeseen, you have to you have to adapt. But in in uh, generally speaking, we are uh, working according to a long and strategic plan. As I said earlier, we have our 2030 vision. There is a strategy. There is a plan, an execution uh, plan to this uh, strategy. But sometime when you find yourself in a situation unexpected. You have to alter a bit. Uh, you have to be always, uh, uh, you know, flexible, uh, but in the main uh, frame, and not to uh, violate. Uh, as I as I said earlier, uh, no one believed that eighty percent of our daily consuming goods comes from our neighboring uh, blockade country. More than eighty percent. In 72 hours, people went to their supermarkets. They didn't feel the difference. Maybe they get better milk quality after 72 hours. But uh, in general, we never change the air. Your Excellency, Israel has the highest number of startups per capita in the world. And the Israeli Defense Forces Military Service has played a pivotal role in building up this startup nation. Unit A200, which trains young Israelis in cybersecurity, hacking, coding, has been described as the foremost technical intelligence agency in the world on par with the NSA. And so many former IDF soldiers have gone on to found startups and occupy top positions in global IT giants. And this has attracted multinationals to establish their R&D centers in Israel to access their talent. Given, the, uh, given that Qatar is similar to Israel in size, access to capital and markets, how is the Ministry of Defense leveraging Qatar's ICT infrastructure, capital, and a young demographic to innovate? Okay. Good question. Uh, <laughs> since we're talking about small states and all the uh, element and aspect of, uh, of small state, uh, we uh, are working hard. And this is one of the fear of the quartet, honestly speaking, that Qatar one day become, they wake up and find out Qatar become a model like Hong Kong or Singapore or the one you mentioned, uh, or Israel uh, in, in, uh, in uh, R&D and in, in, in technology. Let me assure you something. We are working hard. And in the few coming, uh, inshallah, month, you will hear the... Uh, good news, and His Highness the Emir has instructed already that to bring every, you know, we have bits and pieces here and there, but uh, to bring everyone under one umbrella, it will see the light, inshallah, very soon. Inshallah. Salman al-Najjar, Murasil, Television al-Arabi, and I'm going to ask you in the Arabic language, if you want to ask the Prime Minister, if you want to ask the Prime Minister. Of course. سعادة الوزير لا شك مؤخرا كان هناك انفراجة حول وحديث كثير حول محادثات قطرية سعودية تكلم عنها أيضا السيد وزير الخارجية 
لكن هذه المحادثات ريثما توقفت وبشكل مفاجئ لكن المتابع للأخبار يجد أنها توقفت مع مقتل الجنرال قاسم سليماني هل تعتقد أن ثمة ربط ما بين توقف المحادثات بين قطر والسعودية ومقتل الجنرال سليماني؟ هذا السؤال الأول السؤال الثاني سعادة الوزير أنت عسكري سابق وأيضا رجل أعمال وأيضا وزير خارجية فالحصار لا شك أن له تأثيرات جميل الحديث عن ألف يوم من النصر وإن كانت ربما المعركة لم تنتهي بعد حتى الآن ولكن لا شك أن ثمة تأثيرات سلبية لهذا الحصار ما هو الذي تأثر أكثر هنا في قطر برأيكم؟ هل هو الاقتصاد؟ هل هو الموقف السياسي؟ أم الموقف الأمني والعسكري؟ شكرا شكرا بداية إجابتي على سؤالك في البداية قطر منذ اليوم الأول كانت تعلن موقف واضح وهو الانفتاح على التفاوض ولكن التفاوض الغير مشروط وهذا كان إداء قطر من البداية ما, ما تم بعد ذلك أثبت بما لا يدع مجال للشك بأن لا يوجد نية لدى الأطراف الأخرى أنها تجد حل لهذه الأزمة ولكن ربما هذه أول مرة يعني تجي الفرصة نتحدث نعمل. هم لا يرغبون في خروج قطر من مجلس التعاون الخليجي هذا شيء قول يعني واحد وأكيد لكن ما هي أسباب عدم رغبتهم في خروج قطر من مجلس التعاون الخليجي عدم رغبتهم أن لا تخرج قطر من مجلس التعاون الخليجي هو ليس حبا منهم في مجلس التعاون الخليجي نظرة سمو الأمير لمجلس التعاون الخليجي أبعد بكثير من نظرة نظرتهم نظرة سمو الأمير في مجلس التعاون الخليجي أن يكون مجلس التعاون الخليجي له رؤية موحدة ومصدر ومصدر قوة وثبات واستقرار. على العكس تماما هم ينظرون إلى وجود قطر في مجلس التعاون الخليجي حماية لهم هم من الأخطاء اللي ارتكبوها في حق قطر وأن تنفرد قطر في المحاكم الدولية محكمة العدل الدولية ومحكمة الجنايات الدولية وبالتالي بقائها هو قد يكون عذر لهم بأن يدفعون بأن هذه أمور خليجية وتحل في البيت الخليجي ففي فرق بين رؤية قطر لمجلس التعاون الخليجي وبين رؤيتهم القاصرة لقوة وبقاء مجلس التعاون الخليجي هذا من جانب الشق الثاني من السؤال نسيت التأثيرات السلبية حمسني في البداية التأثيرات السلبية التأثيرات السلبية حقيقة أنا ذكرت في السابق وأذكر اليوم وأذكر بكرة أن الشعب القطري مثل الألماس كل ما ضغط عليه كل ما صار يلمع أكثر وأيضا وأيضا أخواننا أخواننا وأصدقائنا المقيمين كان لهم دور كبير إذا كنا تضررنا في قطر فحقيقة إحنا تضررنا من الخيانة لأن ما كنا نتعود على الخيانة. ما كنا يعني متعودين على الخيانة فالخيانة هي مثلا العامل الأول في التضرر العامل الثاني هو النسيج الاجتماعي النسيج الاجتماعي انظر لدرجة بأن يعني يجب أن ننتظر أجيال حتى يستطيعوا أنهم ينسون هذا الشرخ في النسيج الاجتماعي أما الأمور الأخرى فالحمد يعني الحمد لله عندنا شعب حي قطر هي الشعب والشعب هو قطر الآن تقدمنا وتطورنا في كل المجالات تحررنا في مجالات كثيرة استطعنا فيها أن نقفز قفزات عملاقة بسبب هذا الحصار Thank you for being with us tonight but I like to speak in Arabic أنا مصر عشت هنا 25 سنة أهلا وسهلا أقسم بالله العظيم لم أشعر بتفرقة أو بإهانة عشت بينكم في 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 رخاء عندما جاء الحصار كنت أخطط لمغادرة قطر ولكن عندما بدأ هذا الحصار الظالم قررت أن أبقى إذا كنت حتموت من أجل حريتكم حنموت معاكم دي نقطة النقطة الثانية اللي بتهمني موقف مصر شيمفول موقف عبد الفتاح السيسي أو النظام السيسي وليس مصر أي نو يو لايك إيجيبت أنت سيادتك بتحب مصر ولكن المشكلة إن خاشقجي قبل ما ي... يعني قبل ما يذبحوه ويشوروه قال حاجه قال مشكله مصر 4 مليار دولار يرسل لهم سمو الامير او 
فانتوا هترشدوا له والله احنا الاكسباتريتس بره نجمعهم له ونبعتهم له ونحل مشكله مصر، الحقيقه انا يعني شايف انا بعرف مصر ايه مشكلتها في هذا الاسعار، وانا بعتذر لك وللشعب القطري عن ما بدر من عبد الفتاح السيسي كمصري عايش في وسطكم لم اشعر اطلاقا بتفرقه، شكرا جزيلا. انا اشكرك لكن انت مصري سلاش قطري مش مصري يعني مور 25 سنه يعني لا حقيقة مصر ما في حد في القاعة هنا ما يحب مصر الجميع يحب مصر ومصر لها دور كبير ولها وزن كبير احنا نأسف للموقف اللي اتخذته الحكومة في مصر هذا طبيعي المصر تعودنا عليها انها تكون هي من تنزع اي فتيل ينشب في الوطن العربي غياب مصر عن دور الفاعل في الوطن العربي ينشئ مثل هذه الازمات لكن احنا نتمنى دائما لمصر السلامه نتمنى دائما للشعب المصري الخير ويعني تبقى مصر دوله كبيره دوله وازنه ونتمنى لها ان تلعب الدور اللي يفترض ان يكون لمصر يعني انت ذكرتني في موضوع لو رجعنا للتاريخ في السابق العراق لما كانت في صحتها وقوتها كانت عامل توازن في منطقة الخليج وكانت الدول الصغيرة إذا استط... إذا أردنا أن نسميها دول صغيرة سمول ستيت كانت تحس بنوع من الأمان لأن ما يستطيع دولة تتنمر على دولة أخرى بوج... بوجود مصر بوجود عراق قوية ومصر قوية في هذاك الوقت ما كان حد في هذه المنطقة يستطيع أن يتجرأ يتنمر على دولة صغيرة في وجود هذول الدولتين بقوتهم واستقرارهم أنا نسيت النقطة هذه في المحاضرة لكن جدا مهمة لي يعني أبنائنا اللي يدرسون في موضوع التشيك اند بالانس وموازين القوة في السلام عليكم ماي نيم از العنود الثاني I just wanted to ask يعني we were all amazed by the quick response that the Qatari government had to the blockade which clearly no one saw coming because it was such a surprising thing to happen from neighboring countries My question is, how was the Qatari government able to organize itself so effectively and weather the storm in such a short amount of time? As you said, Your Excellency, 72 hours, we were already solving the problem. Thank you. I, I believe we touched on this. Uh, our uh, resilience and our uh, uh, flexibility is a byproduct of a long uh, you know, long uh, time uh, sweat and work. And it started, I can go back, it started from 1995. And uh, when, when this crisis came, yes, it was a shock for us because of the things I mentioned that we are, uh, treason mm -hmm. is not in our uh, DNA. Uh, but because of the preparation and because of the wisemanship again of His Highness the Emir, we have started early to be ready to any uh, crisis. So this is why in 72, fi in 72 hours you, bet you, you find a better uh, dairy product. My name is Hassan Khadr. I have uh, a simple question. So uh, it uh, seems that the ultimate solutions have to end conditional uh, negotiation, right? And uh, we know in negotiation, uh, we need to find a mutual ground to <laughs> negotiate on, right? So uh, my question here, from the quadrant uh, point of view, what do you think their interest uh, that uh, will bring them to uh, this mutual ground and having uh, this uh, negotiation with us? Honestly speaking, I cannot speak on their behalf, but uh, uh, as a member of the government, uh, I always believe what His Highness have directed us. We are open for a discussion. We are here. And any positive step uh, toward us will be countered with uh, two positive steps. Uh, Qatar cannot uh, uh, submit uh, to intimidation, never in our history. 
And uh, if there is a discussion, if there is a negotiation uh, without any condition, we are uh, ready, uh, we are happy to do so. If someone has climbed the tree and does not know how to come down of that tree, if they call for her, we might help and put some ladder. But uh, we will never submit to an intimidation at all. سفير السوري نزال حراكي تحياتي لك سعادة الوزير على كل ما تفضلت به وأنا أريد أن أقحم الملف السوري في ما تحدثتم به اليوم طبعا سؤالي باللغة العربية يعني سامحوني حقيقة اليوم الشعب السوري يدفع ثمن نأي الدول العربية عن القضية السورية اليوم الدول العربية للأسف الشديد هي في في أضعف حالاتها وهي اليوم تلعب بلعبة المحاور بالإضافة إلى المشاكل البينية الموجودة أو المشاكل الداخلية الموجودة لدى أكثر الدول نحن خسرنا كثيرا حقيقة بما جرى في الخليج وما جرى لدولة قطر بعد الحصار الجائر الذي حصل منذ ألف يوم حتى اليوم هل تعتقدون سعادة الوزير بأنه يمكن للملف السوري أن يعود إلى صدارة من جديد؟ نحن نأمل حقيقة بدور قطري أكبر مما كانت عليه منذ الحصار أصبح هناك هم يعني يتعلق بدولة قطر وهذا مما لا شك فيه وهذا من حقكم لكننا خسرنا كثيرا اليوم نحن على يعني في على أبواب أزمة إنسانية لا مثيل لها في القرن العشرين اليوم أكثر من مليون نسمة ينزحون أطفالا ونساء ورجالا وشيوخا باتجاه الشمال وأقصى الشمال باتجاه تركيا نريد دور أكبر للدول العربية بشكل عام ونأمل بدور أكبر لدولة قطر قطر نحن سمعنا عن يعني مساعدة لا يمكن أن نقدرها بثمن اليوم تحت مسمى حق الشام تقوم بها دولة قطر للشعب السوري المنكوب نأمل بدور سياسي أكبر لدولة قطر وشكرا جزيلا شكرا لك ابو عباد لكن حقيقه انا في كلمتين يعني سوريا وضعها يدمي القلب سوريا في قلوبنا جميعا ونتمنى وكنا دائما ننادي بان المجتمع الدولي اصبح عليه التزام اخلاقي بحل مساله الازمه السوريه وانقاذ الشعب السوري وتحقيق لهم الحد الادنى من 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 تطلعاتهم نتمنى إن شاء الله أن يستجيب الضمير العالمي سوريا معقدة كما تعلم سوريا اللاعبين فيها كثر لكن قطر ما تتخلى أبدا عن دورها سواء الدور الإنساني أو الدور القانوني في أن هي تستمر في دفع الدول الفاعلة أنها تتحرك باتجاه أنقاذ سوريا السلام عليكم موضوع بينين باحثة أكاديمية في العلاقات الدولية أم بتطرق لموضوع البنيان الدولي من المؤكد أن البنيان الدولي له أثر على سياسات الدول الصغيرة ودولة قطر كنموذج لهذه الدول الصغيرة نشطت سياستها الخارجية في ظل أحاد القطبية لكن الدراسات الحالية تؤكد أن أو تكاد تتفق على أن قدرة هذه الدول أو قدرة الدول الصغيرة على التحرك السياسي المستقل في النسق الدولي يزداد بازدياد الطابع التعددي للبنيان وازدياد أيضا درجة الصراع في الوحدات الكبرى والمكونة له السؤال هو هل إلى أي مدى أثر البنيان الدولي على سياسات وأم دولة قطر وفي حالة التغيرات الظاهرة اللي احنا الحين نشوفها في تحول إلى التعددية قطر هل هي قادرة على تحمل تكاليف الناشئة عن هذا التغير والتحول إلى شريك مثلاً آخر إذا دون أن يتأثر نظامها الاقتصادي أو السياسي أو الأمني شكراً أحد عوامل موجة نظري أحد عوامل القوة الناعمة التي تتمتع فيها دولة قطر هي أنها ما تتبع لسياسة المحاور قطر ما تتبع لمحور ألف أو محور باء أو بلوك أي ولا بلوك بي وهذا الكلام قديم قطر استطاعت أنها تخلق أرضية للحوار للأطراف 
اللي ما ينتمون لهذه المحاور وهذا ربما ضايق كثير من من الدول اللي تنظر لنا ان احنا يجب ان نكون تبع لجهه دون جهه اخرى. هذا 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 سبب، السبب الاخر انفتاح قطر على العالم الخارجي العلاقات المتعدده، العلاقات الثنائيه. ثلاثه نجاح قطر دائما في ان هي وسيط موثوق فيه. احنا ان شاء الله يعني نتوقع أن نشهد اتفاقية سلام بين الحكومة الأمريكية والطالبان في أفغانستان وهذه عملت عليه قطر منذ سنوات رغم كل المصاعب اللي واجهتنا رغم كل المخربين اللي حاولوا لنظرتهم القاصرة في أمن المنطقة بأن يعني يسممون هذا الملف مش لأجل شيء ولا لأجل السلام العالمي بس لأجل أنه قطر هي اللي تتحرك في هذا الموضوع. ومع ذلك بفضل من الله عز وجل قطر نجحت في انها تحط الاطراف المتصارعه حد لهذا النزاع الدموي الطويل. قطر توسطت في ارتيريا وجيبوتي، قطر توسطت في لبنان، قطر لها كثير من الوساطات ولذلك اصبحت لاعب موثوق فيه، لاعب صعب في المجتمع الدولي. وهذه احد احد الادوات القوه الناعمه لدوله قطر. السلام عليكم. عبد الرحمن النصار، جورج تاون، كلاس اوف 2011. Uh, first of all, thank you, Your Excellency, for being with us uh, today. And also, thank you for being a figure of inspiration and hope throughout the past uh, 1000 days. Uh, my question is about self sufficiency, however, from a different perspective. We often link self sufficiency uh, when it comes to our food, our groceries, our daily needs. Uh, my question is military equipment related. We, we, we saw or we witnessed over the past couple of years a ramp up in military procurement. When do we expect to see the day that we manufacture our own ammunition, but starting from ammunition and all the way to fifth generation jet fighters? Thank you for the question, Ahmad. Rest assured, uh, I won't tell you this information. <laughs> But be confident, please. <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. And sorry for everyone. All good things come to an end. Uh, I would like now, uh, thank you so much for, for this session. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dori Miller and Dr. Fahd Mari to offer a token of our appreciation. Dear Ahmed, thank you very much. As we announced earlier, His Excellency will now go and meet privately with the students to recruit them. Thank you so much.